our, uh, our next speaker. I'm excited about this. Uh, Steve Hindi is the co-founder and chairman of the Brooklyn Brewery and is a former Middle East correspondent for the Associated Press. He's a longtime member and past chairman of the board of directors of the Brewers Association and co-author of Beer School, Bottling Success at the Brooklyn Brewery. I'm a big fan. Um, welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I, I came to Cornell in 1967, and I wanted to design golf courses. I had won a few tournaments in high school, and uh, I knew that uh, Robert Trent Jones, the most famous golf course architect, was a Cornellian, so I got into landscape architecture. Uh, my golf game was pretty good. At the end of freshman year, I had a two handicap. I played on the team, but my grade point average was 1.8. <laughs> and you know what that means at Cornell. So um, I, I quit golf entirely and kind of bounced around different, uh, uh, you know, I, I did some business courses in the ag school. I took a bunch of sociology classes and, uh, you know, at Cornell you can find any instruction in any study as Ezra Cornell intended. So I ended up majoring in English. Uh, and I graduated with a, a degree in uh, teaching English, a master's. And I tried teaching high school English uh, in, in uh, Ithaca, and I almost had a nervous breakdown. I, <laughs> it's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. I couldn't wait to get out of the classroom. And I ran away to uh, work for a newspaper in Geneva, New York. It was called the Geneva Times, now the Finger Lakes Times. Um, I married my uh, uh, high school girlfriend, Ellen Foote, and uh, eventually we moved down around New York City and I was working for newspapers uh, and uh, we, uh, we split up and we got divorced. And I got a, a, a job with Associated Press, uh, which was my big chance in Newark, New Jersey. And you know, AP is a worldwide news gathering organization and uh, it was kind of a strange time in my life. I got it in my head I wanted to cover a war. So I studied Arabic and said, I want to go to Beirut. There was a war going on in Beirut at that time. This is like 1976, 77. And uh, as it turns out, there aren't too many people who want to go to Beirut and cover wars. So a year after I volunteered for that, I landed in Beirut as the Middle East correspondent for AP. That was. February 1979, when uh, uh, the Shah of Iran fell and Ayatollah Khomeini came to power. So I, I was sent to Beirut, and I was sent to Iran shortly after I got there. And I covered the tail end of the revolution and eventually the hostage crisis before I got thrown out of uh, Iran. I know you're very young here, so you know the movie Argo? It, <laughs> that period. Uh, <laughs> so. I, I lived in uh, Beirut, and uh, I, I, uh, soon after I was thrown out of Iran, I went, went back into Iran with the Iraqi army when they invaded. I covered the Iran-Iraq war uh, for uh, about a year, the first year of that war. Living in Beirut was kind of crazy. Uh, you know, there was a civil war going on. Um, I missed my uh, high school girlfriend, my ex-wife, I started writing to her, and eventually I convinced her to come to Beirut. So she came to Beirut, and it was quiet when she was there. Lebanon's a beautiful country, a fascinating country. And we decided to get back together. So we got remarried in Beirut during the war. Uh, and uh, you know we, we had our first child there. Actually, when Ellen was uh, eight months pregnant, I was abducted in South Lebanon. I was with a UN peacekeeping patrol. And uh, the people who abducted us tortured and killed two of the Irishmen who were with me. Uh, and a third guy they shot. And we carried him out and got him on a helicopter. And he lived. I'm telling you this because uh, about four years ago, Homeland Security agents came to the brewery in Brooklyn. I'm going to get around to beer here. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> they told me they thought the guy who had abducted me 33 years ago is living in Detroit running an ice cream truck. 
And they showed me headshots of 50 Arab men, and I said, that's him. And they said, yep, would you testify against him? And I said, yes. So I did. He was arrested. He's on, on trial now in Beirut, accused of double murder of the two people and attempted murder of, of the other guy. So we had our first child in Beirut, and it was kind of, <laughs> it, it was kind of nerve-wracking. Uh, living in Beirut with a baby. Uh, and so I got AP to move me to Cairo. And I uh, moved to Cairo. Uh, and uh, I got there just in time to be sitting behind President Sadat of Egypt when he was assassinated. Uh, and then after that, I had to go back to Beirut whenever there was a big story. And as you know, there were a lot of big stories. Uh, you know, the embassy bombing, the marine bombing, the, the Israeli invasion, the massacres in the refugee camps. I covered all those stories. Um, and then AP wanted me to go to the Philippines next because there was turmoil in the Philippines. And I was all excited, you know, big story. And Ellen said, uh-uh, <laughs> I'm not going to the Philippines. I'm, I, we had two children by then. She said, I, I, if, if you get posted to Rome, I'm with you. <laughs> Manila, forget it. I'm going home. I'm taking the children. I hope you come with me. So I gave it up, uh, chose my family over my career, came back to New York. So the beer thing began in Cairo. Uh, actually, I drank a lot of beer in those years, I, <laughs> and whiskey, and you know, just about anything else I could get my hands on. <laughs> but um, in Cairo, I met American diplomats who had worked in Saudi Arabia for three years. They'd posted in Saudi Arabia, where there's Islamic law, no alcoholic beverages. And these guys were avid, avid homebrewers. Uh, so I drank their homebrew. It was amazing. They continued homebrewing in Cairo because the beer in Cairo was pretty awful. And then when I got back to uh, New York, I started making beer at home. I went to work for a newspaper, Newsday, doing uh, foreign news. I had a great job, but I was really bored. Uh, uh, you know, being an editor, the, I, the idea of uh, the rest of my life, uh, you know, doing that, I, just, I couldn't take it. And I'd always kind of dreamed of uh, starting a business. I had no training at all in starting a business. When I was a kid, I won a lot of contests selling things. Uh, you know, I was once the most popular newsboy in Ohio, uh, <laughs> selling newspaper subscriptions. I got a two-week trip to Brazil. I was only 12 years old. But that, that was essentially my resume for starting uh, Brooklyn Brewery. My downstairs neighbor in Brooklyn was a young uh, Yaley with an MBA from Columbia, Tom Potter. And so Tom thought I was a lunatic, but eventually I persuaded him uh, to go to the Craft Brewers Conference in Oregon, 1986. At that time, there were fewer than uh, 25 craft breweries uh, in the US. They're all at this conference, and there's Tom in a Brooks Brothers suit, a banker from New York City. All these guys are forcing their business plans on him, like, you know, maybe this guy can uh, be a source of funding, not realizing that Tom was actually scouting out the possibility of, of starting a brewery. So he came back uh, to, to New York, uh, convinced it could be a business. We did a business plan, and uh, our plan was to raise a half million dollars. And early on, we did some things right that turned out to be really important. I'm not sure we understood how important at the time. Uh, but the first thing was, my job was to develop the marketing end of the company. You know, like why Brooklyn? Brooklyn's an amazing, uh, has an amazing brewing history. There were uh, like 48 breweries in Brooklyn in 1898 when it became part of New York City. The last two big breweries in Brooklyn had closed in 1976, uh, Schaefer and Rheingold. So our, our mission was to bring brewing back to Brooklyn. Uh, I wanted to call the company Brooklyn Eagle Brewery, after the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper edited by Walt Whitman, only because of my newspaper background. And so I started talking to artist friends uh, and then design firms about developing the identity of the company. And uh, everyone was trying to sell me. They were flattering me, telling me this is a brilliant idea. I knew I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted someone to tell me what to do. Uh, and I got very frustrated. And 
my wife, Ellen, one night, she's, I, I interviewed 30 design firms. Uh, Ellen said, look, why don't you find out who the best designers in New York are? And you know, you're a journalist, you don't mind cold, cold calling anyone any time of the night or day. So I called these hotshot design firms and Tom and I got meetings with Tremayev and Geismar and Pentagram and you know, they'd have us for lunch with a catered lunch and they'd show their work and uh, it was all pretty heady considering Tom and I probably had $20 between us uh, at that time. Uh, the only designer I knew anything about was Milton Glaser uh, because when I was at Cornell, Milton designed the covers of the Penguin Shakespeare series and the Herman Hess books. And I also knew that he had done the, the Bob, Dylan, Bob Dylan's early albums. And of course he did the I, I Love New York logo. So I was excited to meet Milton. When I called his office, a woman named Eva answered the phone. I told her who I was and, and she said, do you know who Milton is? And I said, well, yeah, I hear he's pretty good. You know, I wanna, <laughs> and she said, well, he doesn't just talk to anyone who calls here. Um, so it kind of brought out the journalist in me. You know, I was determined to meet him. I started bugging Eva every day, from, calling from the newspaper. And eventually she said, you're not gonna give up, are you? And I said, no, I wanna talk to Milton Glaser. And she said, okay, here he is. And I kind of blurted out the idea about Brooklyn Eagle beer. And uh, Milton said, wow, that sounds like fun. Come and see me. So we ended up making a deal with Milton. Uh, we could never afford his rates. Uh, actually, I was surprised how expensive it was to get a corporate identity, even from a, a firm nobody would he heard of, you know, let alone Milton Glaser. But we gave Milton a $20,000 unit of our first $500,000 offering, and then we paid him by the hour for his work. It wasn't cheap, um, but at the first meeting, I told him all about Brooklyn Eagle Beer, and uh, he said, look, we got Brooklyn here. Let's forget about the eagle, you know, ditch the bird. Brooklyn, you know, nobody's claiming Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a really fascinating place. It's got a special place in the imagination of a lot of people in America. And, and it's, it's a great name for a beer. And then a few days later, he unveiled the logo. He had it all set up on a bottle. And uh, when he pulled the, you know, the cover off it, I, I said, that's it? And he said, look, don't say a word. Take it home, show it to your wife, don't show it to a lot of people, uh, you know, just live with it a little. So I did, and I began to see the beauty of the logo. It was something fresh for Brooklyn, but it kind of evoked uh, the baseball history of Brooklyn, but it wasn't just, you know, a smarmy uh, nostalgia kind of thing. Uh, so we got that right uh, early on. Uh, the second thing we got right was the result of one of our neighbors in Brooklyn. Uh, Sophia Collier had started a company called Soho Natural Soda. And it really, it was the first of the, what is now known as a new age beverage uh, category, you know, challenge to Coke and Pepsi. And she was selling her company to Seagram's uh, when we were starting up for like 25 million bucks. So we were pretty impressed by Sophia. I stopped her on the a street one day and asked her if she'd talk to us. At that time, we had a test brew, we had our logo. So she came over, she said, this is great. The beer is really different than mainstream beers. You got a great point of difference. Milton Glaser's fantastic, the logo's fantastic, but this is not gonna work unless you guys distribute your own beer. And we're like, distribute beer in New York City? You know, I, I mean, I can hardly afford my car insurance. And, and what about parking tickets? And what about the mafia? I mean. All, all, all of our investors, one of the first thing investors said, beer in Brooklyn, are you crazy? Uh, and Sophia said, yeah, there are a lot of problems out there, but when you're small, no one's gonna bother you. So she told us about starting out with Soho and failing through traditional distributors. She didn't sell her product till she bought a van, put her logo on the van, and went out there and peddled it her, herself. And so uh, we took her advice, we threw away our original business plan, which was really to build a small brewery and, and make draft beer and peddle it you know, in, a, in our neighborhood. Uh, instead, we had a van with our logo and we went out, we, we contracted to produce the beer in Utica at the FX Matt uh, Brewery, which I'm sure many of you Cornellians know for Saranac and uh, uh, maybe the older Cornellians remember Utica Club beer. Um, 
And we trucked it down to Bushwick. We had a uh, warehouse in an old uh, uh, brewery building in Bushwick. Uh, Bushwick was really scary at that time. Uh, truck drivers would not come there after dark. And, uh, you know, we went out, I, and, and it was really difficult. I mean, you know, our beer, Brooklyn Lager, which I know now is kind of an entry-level craft beer, back then uh, it was a shock to people's notion of what beer is because, you know, most beer sold in, in America was light lager beer. Uh, so, but probably one in 15 customers uh, were, in, you know, took our beer in and actually made an effort to sell it. Um, the other thing we did right early on was uh, uh, marketing. Um, I realized that New York City is an incredibly noisy media market. We could never afford to advertise in New York. So we decided instead of doing any of that traditional kind of stuff, we would donate beer to uh, charities, to uh, organizations, causes we believed in, to uh, uh, you know, arts organizations. There were a lot of artists in, in Brooklyn at that time. And uh, it was a way for us to get the beer into people's hands, get sampling, um, and also to do good works. Uh, and you know, we built a tremendous amount of goodwill uh, in those early years by donating beer. We still do the same thing uh, 30 years later. That's the way we market ourselves. Uh, and We've actually become an international brand without ever having done any kind of advertising. Uh, you probably don't know, we're, we're among uh, the top 10 of all the craft breweries in the US. There are now 5,850 uh, breweries in the United States, up from 50 breweries at the time uh, I started. Uh, and uh, I think, that decision to do guerrilla marketing, you know, we do a lot of special events trying to celebrate uh, entrepreneurial culture and, and, and startup uh, business kind of culture. We do those in Brooklyn. We do them in all the cities where we sell beer. We celebrate their local culture. Uh, and, you know, we've been able, I know that craft beer is a lot about being local but it's also about brands, and some brands travel better than other brands. And luckily, the Brooklyn brand has been an incredible calling card for us. Um, being an international brand was never uh, one of our uh, objectives in the early days of the company. Uh, but we had people coming, because we're here in New York City, we had people coming to us from Japan, from Sweden, from Italy, from, you know, from Australia, who had tried the beer in New York and said, wow, we don't have anything like this in our country. We'd like to import this beer to those countries. And for, for me, I don't know if I said this, but what I was thinking was, I can't sell it in Brooklyn. Are you kidding me? You're going to sell it in Tokyo? Have you lost your mind? Uh, but we needed cash, so we said, okay, look, we'll send you beer, but you gotta pay us first. And that's a terrible deal for them, uh, a great deal for us, and it was the only way we could do it uh, because we needed the cash. So we started doing that almost from the very beginning, and we didn't pay any attention to it. We could have totally ruined our brand that way by sending beer out and having it go, you know, beer is perishable after all. Having it go bad and then people taste the beer, get a bad image of it, and that's the end of things. But actually, over the years, uh, we began to sell more and more beer uh, in those countries uh, around the world. And probably about, uh, about 15 years ago, we started to pay more attention to it. The, the people importing were total amateurs. Like our first importer in Sweden was an SAS pilot, you know, a, a Scandinavian, Scandinavian air uh, pilot. First in Japan was a Japanese oil company executive. Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually we got more sophisticated importers, traditional importers in the first case, and then uh, big companies, Carlsberg, the number 
actually I think it's number three brewery in the world now, Carlsberg based in, in Denmark, uh, started, in, actually they gave our brewmaster, Garrett Oliver, an award for his book, The Brewmaster's Table in 2003. And they started importing uh, Brooklyn beers to Scandinavia. Uh, and, and suddenly uh, it became a, a big part of our business in Asia. We recently did a deal with the Kirin Brewery uh, in Tokyo. They bought 24% of Brooklyn Brewery, uh, a minority share. And their main interest is establishing the Brooklyn brand in Japan. Because what's happened in the US with the decline of the, the light lager giant beers and the rise of craft beer, it's happening all over the world now. So in Japan, the four big companies there all make the same kind of light lager beer, and those are declining. So Kirin has decided to really push uh, with American craft beer. And the way distribution works in Japan, that's the only hope we would ever have of really reaching a big part of the market. We've sold beer in Japan for 30 years, but never more than like 30,000 cases or something like that. We think that with Kirin, uh, we're, we're going to sell a lot more beer, and it's going to become an important brand in Japan. Also, the CEO of the Kirin Brewery is a graduate of Cornell. He went to the uh, hotel school. And uh, Yoshinori Isozaki. Uh, Yoshi and I taught a class at Cornell uh, about a month ago uh, in, in the business school. And uh, that, that was a big thrill for me. And for Yoshi, I think. He, he's friends with the dean of the, the hotel school. But, um, you know, being an international brand is uh, exciting and, and fun. Uh, I just returned from a trip to Portugal, Norway, and uh, Scotland, uh, where I was basically telling stories. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm chairman of the company now, so I'm basically an ambassador. Uh, for Brooklyn Brewery. Um, but uh, it's been an incredible adventure, and uh, I'm, I, I owe a lot to the name Brooklyn and to Milton Glaser, our designer. Design is really important for any kind of uh, consumer product. I would uh, advise any of you getting into that to not, uh, not take that for granted, because it's, it's really, really uh, critical. You've got to have a great product, but it's got to look good. And you got to get it distributed. And, and uh, you know, making the great product is like step one. Um, you know, uh, so I, I started playing golf again when, <laughs> when I uh, uh, started the brewery, because golf is kind of useful in, in the beer business. Um, and uh, the two most prominent uh, golf course architects now, uh, Tom Doak and Gil Hans, are both Cornell grads. So I was on to something there, you know, <laughs> 50 years ago. But I'm pretty happy the way, the direction I took. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>